the ancient scriptures, the Vimanas of the Hindu culture are mentioned as chariots of fire that took the prophet Elijah with them, or the cloud that accompanied the people of Israel. But there are also other historical references that suggest there were technological devices in the past that could fly. Apparently, these types of vehicles were able to rise to heaven and are much more common than we thought. Today, we will focus on the Oriental traditions that describe the existence of airworthy magic carpets. These have nothing to do with the usual carpets that we walk on today and decorate floors or walls. Magic carpets possess technological properties that were previously unknown and unimaginable to us. Nevertheless, we will try to discover how they were possible. Literature references from the biblical period to the present day describe the existence of this type of aircraft. Perhaps the stories or films made us believe that it was just a fantasy, but there is much to suggest that it is very likely that the flying carpet really existed. The popular story, Thousand and One Nights, tells the story of how Prince Hussein, the eldest son of the Sultan of India, travels to Biznagar, Vijayanagara, it is not only the richest city in India, but in the world. There, he buys a magical carpet from a merchant that is faster than any modern plane and able to transport a person from one place to another in no time at all. But long before this unique Oriental story was included in the stories of A Thousand and One Nights, we have an even more detailed record that goes even further back in time. This is the magic carpet of King Solomon, the third king of Israel. He was a descendant of King David, who was considered the most powerful man of his time, thanks to his wealth, his collection of holy objects, and his vast knowledge. He is also the oldest historical figure associated with the use of magic carpets. The holy book of the Ethiopians, the Kebra Nagast, or Honor of the Kings, makes references to Solomon's flying carpet. Among the many gifts that God had given to Solomon was the understanding of the language of birds. Not only was he able to communicate with them, but he also had all kinds of knowledge of them. King Solomon was considered the lord of men, jinn, and birds. He flew on his magical green silk carpet through the air, driven by the wind under his control. His army accompanied him on the right, the spirits on the left, and a huge group of birds flew over the carpet, giving shade to its passengers. According to legends, Solomon's carpet could carry his entire court and his army. In other words, his magic carpet could accommodate tens of thousands of people. According to Cape Nagast, King Solomon visited the Queen of Sheba and her son Menelik in an object capable of flying. It was called the Heavenly Chariot. The king and all who obeyed his word flew on the chariot without pain or suffering, without sweat or exhaustion, and traveled a distance in one day as far as it would take three months to walk. Nicholas Rorich, Russian explorer and writer, mentions the peaks of the mountains King Solomon has flown over, also known as Solomon's Thrones and recounts a tale that an old Muslim man once told him. Everyone knows the tales of King Solomon, that he flew all over the earth, and that he knew the deepest truths of all the lands, and that he was even in the distant stars. Other sources also confirm the existence of King Solomon's flying carpet, adding unusual details to the history of the magic carpet of the Orient. In present-day Iran, the French archaeologist Henri Bach discovered some well-preserved parchment rolls found in the underground chambers of Alamut Castle. The manuscripts were written in the 13th century by a Jewish scholar named Isaac ben Sherira. The scrolls reveal a work from compilations of various documents over 50 years. It seems that its author had hidden them just at the time when his life was in danger. The translation of the documents was carried out by Professor C. G. D. Septimus of the University of London and was published under the title The Manuscript of Alamut. Ben Sherira 
explains how Muslim leaders considered the magic carpets to be the devil's work, so that the existing carpets and their makers were persecuted and eliminated. Moreover, religious leaders believed that God had not created man to fly, but that he had to stand with his feet on the ground. He quotes an example from 1213 AD when flying carpets were used by Prince Beros of the eastern Persian state of Khorasan. He used his archers like an air cavalry to penetrate the enemy castle and win the battle. However, when the Turkish rulers understood what immense power the magic carpets possessed, they waged a fierce battle against this mighty artifact and punished Prince Beros. Ben Sharira mentions two other texts relating to the use of magic carpets. One of them is a book of Proverbs written by Shamsha'ad, a minister of the Babylonian king Nabuchodonosor, and the other is an old book of dialogues written by Josephus. He also adds further details about King Solomon's flying carpet, complementing the brief mention of these exceptional craft in Kebra Nagast. But also in his chronicle, he dedicates some passages to the functionality of the magic carpet. Unfortunately, most of the vocabulary used is not decipherable, so that we do not know its real source of power. However, the manuscripts show how the Guild of Craftsmen made these special carpets. They were spun on a loom like an ordinary carpet, the big difference being in the dyeing process. Only these craftsmen knew the process of its manufacture. They also used a special type of clay from the mountain springs that could not be touched by any person. And when it was heated to the right temperature, the carpet was given anti-magnetic properties. First, the craftsmen prepared the clay and dyed the wool with it. And then they wove it. And when the carpet was finished, it was stretched on the floor, and depending on the concentration of the clay used, the carpet could either float a few centimeters from the floor or up to several meters high. Ben Sharira explains how craftsmen began to weave larger and larger carpets over time. But as the number of people to transport increased, the height and speed decreased. As far as its movement is concerned, it followed the route of the planet's magnetic lines, which function as invisible air tracks. Even today, science is still trying to better understand this technology, which until now has been called ley lines. The magnetism of the Earth is distributed in millions of magnetic lines that traverse the entire surface of the planet. They form an electromagnetic network that was used by the flying carpets. This would be proof that in the past there was a means of transport powered by free, infinite, and environmentally friendly energy. Ben Sharira explains how the magic carpet was unfortunately demonized by the rich and powerful echelons of society. It seems as though they did not want this technology to spread. Ben Sharira also describes how the great Alexandria Library, founded by Ptolemy I, had magic carpets at its readers' disposal. When the readers entered the library, they took off their shoes and received a carpet to sneak through the shelves full of papyrus manuscripts. The library was built in a ziggurat with 40,000 cylinders, and the ceiling was so high that readers preferred to read while floating in the air. Although the library was damaged in the Civil War under the Roman Emperor Aurelianus, its final destruction is attributed to a Muslim general. He burned all the papyrus rolls to heat the 600 baths of Alexandria. The carpets were thrown into the sea by the Arabian Bedouins. But the destruction of the magic carpets took place in the early 13th century, when Genghis Khan destroyed most Central Asia's cities. The Mongols killed the inhabitants of the cities and plundered their treasures. Included among all the treasures plundered were the magic carpets. When a prisoner told them that these things were more agile than the horses of the steppes, this was a great insult for the Mongols. So they were ordered to confiscate and burn all the magic carpets of their vast empire, all but one.
Ben Shirira writes that the great Genghis Khan had ordered that the most beautiful magic carpet should be saved for his deathbed at his funeral, in order to make his journey to the afterlife. So ends the amazing story of an artifact that could have been of use to all mankind, but those who had the power decided to condemn it to oblivion. We don't know if they did it because they felt threatened, or because perhaps they had the full knowledge of what these carpets were really capable of. Whatever the reason, it seems that they have managed to put an end to an advanced flying device of infinite energy that remains in our minds only as fantasies of some authors of fiction stories.